Uh, before we get started, though, I want to introduce you to our moderator today. We have Amber, who is in the chat. She's going to be moderating our comments. And if you saw that awesome prioritization webinar last week, you met Amber. Um, she gave that really great presentation on tackling prioritization questions. Um, if you weren't able to make it last week, it is saved on our Facebook page. So I would definitely recommend giving that um, a watch. There was a lot of really great information in there. Um, so Amber is over in our comments. So if you have questions or if you just want to say hi, um, be sure to leave her a comment. Um, sometimes there is a little bit of a delay in those comments popping up. So if she doesn't get back to you right away, um, don't worry, just give her a second. She'll get there. Um, and she's also going to be dropping some really helpful links um, in the comment section as we go along too. So pay attention to that. All right, well, I'd like to officially welcome you to our webinar on standalone questions today. If you haven't seen me before, my name is Courtney. Um, I am also one of the nurses here at Boot Camp who helps write our standalone questions, our case studies, and maybe you've even seen me in some of those case study walkthroughs. Um, so I have been a nurse since 2010 um, and a, a psychiatric nurse practitioner since 2017. So when I first started off as a nurse, I worked in all kinds of places. I worked in long-term care. I worked um, on a neurosurgical and trauma unit for a little while. Um, I worked for a public health department for a couple of years. And then I eventually made my transition over to mental health where I worked on inpatient psych um, while I was going back to school to become a nurse practitioner. And then once I graduated, I worked mostly in uh, partial hospital programming, uh, specializing in anxiety disorders, OCD, and PTSD. Um, but by far, I have to say my favorite job is boot camp because I love helping students um, study for and pass their NCLEX and take it from me as somebody who has taken both the NCLEX and nurse practitioner boards. I know how stressful this time can be. Um, so our goal here at boot camp is to hopefully make the NCLEX a little bit less stressful. So if you stick with us, we'll help you get through it. And if you have any friends who are also studying for the NCLEX, be sure you invite them over as well um, because we don't want anybody um, to miss out on all the really great resources that we have to offer. So let's go over what we're going to be talking about today. So we are covering standalone items. Specifically, we are going to be covering single best multiple choice questions. And we are focusing on these today because we have gotten a lot of requests from students saying that you want more practice with single best questions. And that makes a lot of sense because you will likely see a lot of these on the NCLEX. And these types of questions can cover a really big variety of topics. We see them in prioritization, we see them in pharmacology, we see them cover specialty topics like cardiology and even uh, mental health. So it makes sense that we get a lot of practice with these. Um, so I have hand selected for you uh, five um, single best multiple choice questions today that we're going to go through together. And we're going to break each one of these questions down. We're going to talk about how to think about this question like a nurse and how to tackle these questions in a way that really um, makes sense. So before we dive into our practice questions, we're just going to cover briefly how these item types are scored. And then we're going to talk about a few tips and strategies um, for approaching these items. So how are single best multiple choice questions scored? Well, it's really, really simple. These follow a zero one scoring rule. So if you answer the question correctly, you get one point. If you answer the question incorrectly, you get zero points. That's all there is to it. There's nothing fancy when it comes to scoring these item types. <clears throat> so let's talk a little bit about how to approach these questions. The biggest advice or the best advice I can give to NCLEX test takers is make sure you read the header and the stem very carefully. Because I will admit, even I have been guilty of this, I haven't read that stem all the way through and it's caused me to get the answer wrong, even if I knew the content. So let me give you an example of what I mean. So you might get a question stem that says, which of the following actions should the nurse take? So that means we're looking for a correct action. But then we might get another item stem that says which of the following actions would cause the nurse to intervene. 
So that means we're looking for an incorrect action, right? That's a negatively phrased question. And then we might get a completely different stem that says, which of the following actions should the nurse take first? And so that means that all of those actions are gonna be correct in the sense that we are gonna take those actions at some point, but only one of them is going to be the priority. So you can see that if we don't read those carefully, we might end up answering that question incorrectly. So always read carefully. So once I've read the header and the stem, I like to take a step back and ask myself, what do I already know about this topic? So if it's a pharmacology question, I ask myself, what do I know about this medication class? Are there common side effects? Are there really serious reactions? And I do that because it helps me kind of separate out that information in my head and allows me to not get distracted by irrelevant information when I'm reading um, the answer options in that question. So once I've kind of reviewed that topic in my head, then I go on and start ruling out options. So let's apply this to some questions. So our first practice question is going to be a prioritization question. So if you attended the webinar with Amber last week, uh, this is going to look really familiar to you, or this item type will look really familiar to you. So in this question, we have an emergency room nurse who has received change of shift report on the following clients. And then we're being asked which, which client should the nurse see first? So this is a prioritization question, right? So when I'm thinking about which client should I see first, we need to think about which client is at the most imminent risk for life-threatening complications if we don't see them right away. Because remember, NCLEX is a safety exam, right? So before we look at our answer options, let's go and take a look at our little prioritization pyramid, which Amber introduced you to last week, a really helpful resource that we have here at Bootcamp. And this was designed specifically to help us with prioritization questions. So let's think about what we're gonna do first. When we're looking at clients um, that we have listed out, we need to determine who we need to see first. So our first option, or our first um, thing we're gonna do is to eliminate all those stable and chronic issues. So let me give you an example of that. So if we have a chronic issue, so say we have somebody who is a smoker and they've been smoking for 20 years and they have a chronic cough. Well, a chronic cough isn't normal, but it's a chronic issue, right? It's been going on for a long time. Nothing's really changed. So if we don't address that issue within the next few minutes, probably nothing terrible is gonna happen, right? So I'm gonna rule out anything that's stable and chronic. And then from there, I like to start at the top of my pyramid and work my way down. So I'm gonna rule out any clients with expected findings or psychosocial needs or issues. So a little tip for you, those psychosocial needs or issues are often used as distractors. So we might see clients who are really anxious or they're upset or they have um, financial difficulties, maybe they lost a job. And so we're not saying that those issues aren't important and don't need to be addressed, but in the world of prioritization, psychosocial issues aren't gonna cause life-threatening issues, right? So those are gonna be a lower priority than these that are in yellow and red. So next we're gonna look for any dis or neurological disability, any issues with circulation, or any issues with breathing or perfusion. And then of course we have our two big ones, our airway and safety. And this makes a lot of sense, right? Because if a client has an airway obstruction, how long do we have to intervene with that? Like seconds, right? Because if they're not getting oxygen, that's gonna be a problem really quickly, right? So we need to address that first, and then we need to think about safety. And that's going to refer to anything that is an imminent, life-threatening risk to the client's safety. So now that we've kind of reviewed in our head what we know about prioritization, let's go back to our question and see if we can use that to figure out who we should see first. So the nurse, the nurse should first see the seven-year-old who fell out of the tree and is cradling a discolored and swollen arm. So if he's got a discolored and swollen arm, what do we think might be happening here? I'm kind of thinking he might have a strain or a sprain. Either way, that's kind of a localized issue, right? So we could probably say that that is a stable issue because we don't have any systemic involvement, right? 
So let's move on to our, th our second option. We have a three-year-old who has been vomiting for 12 hours and has a temperature of 103.6. So this vomiting has me a little concerned. What do we worry about if a client's been vomiting for 12 hours? I'm kind of worried about dehydration, right? And what could happen if we have dehydration? What might that lead to? Yeah, hypovolemia, of course. And that's gonna be a circulatory issue, right? All right, so that's a little more concerning to me than option number one, and let's take a look at our next one. We have an 18-month-old who is vomiting and was found with an open bottle of drain cleaner. All right, so we're thinking that they have swallowed this drain cleaner, and what do we know about drain cleaner? It's corrosive, right? So that can't mean anything good for t body tissues, can it? So that could cause um, tissue damage. We might see some inflammation. And that's probably gonna end up right here in the esophagus, right? So what is right next to the esophagus that could cause some issue if we have tissue damage and swelling? Is anyone else worried about airway? Right? Because that swelling could move into the airway. So that would be, that would be concerning, right? That would be an airway issue. And let's take a look at our last option. We have a five-year-old with epilepsy who experienced a seizure 30 minutes ago that lasted three minutes. So if they had a seizure, that could be neurological disability, right, on our prioritization pyramid. Um, but this happened 30 minutes ago, so we're not being told that there's anything um, going on right now. So let's take a look at what we have. So if we go back to our prioritization pyramid, remember we had our client with the, the uh, bruised arm and we said that would probably be a, considered a stable condition because it's not systemic. Um, and then we had our client who was vomiting. We said we were worried about dehydration, which could cause a circulatory issue. We had our client who swallowed drain cleaner, which we said could probably be an airway issue. And then we had a client with our seizure, which was our neurological disability. So that makes it pretty easy to figure out who we need to see first, right? And I see a lot of people are commenting that you're liking option number three. I like option number three too. Let's go and look and see if we were all correct. And yes, look at that. I see a lot of people. I'm looking at your comments. You are all getting it right. Good job. All right, so moving on to practice question number two. So this is going to be a pharmacology question. So we have a nurse who is caring for a client with hypertension who is taking Lisinopril. And we're being asked which of the following client findings is most concerning. So again, this is kind of a prioritization question, right? So we might see all of these findings, but one of them is going to be most concerning, okay? So again, like we talked about, let's step back and think about what do we know about lisinopril? Who knows anything about lisinopril? What drug class is this? This is an ACE inhibitor, right? And if we're kind of being general, what other medications might we see in this category? We might have, um, what, enalapril, lisinopril, benazapril, right? All of those ACE inhibitors, they all end in pril, right? Okay, so this is a ACE inhibitor. What are ACE inhibitors used for? They're used to lower blood pressure, right? Treat hypertension, okay? What are some common side effects? What do we know about that? What are ACE inhibitors known for? I know that they can cause a chronic cough, right? And that can be pretty mild to intense and that can be kind of an annoying side effect, right? Um, what do we know about severe reactions to ACE inhibitors? Yep, I see a lot of people dry cough. Oh, I see someone. Yep, you got it. Angioedema. Who was that? Michelle. All right. So angioedema is the big adverse reaction we want to keep a lookout for. And that involves what? The swelling of the lips, the tongue. What happens if we get a lot of swelling in the face? That can cause airway issues, right? It can cause an airway obstruction. 
Okay, so we already know a lot about ACE inhibitors, right? So let's see if that helps us answer our question of what would be most concerning. So we have option number one of itchy lips and tongue. What might that mean? Could that mean that they might be developing angioedema? I think it might, right? Because itchy lips and tongue are kind of the first sign of that swelling. Okay, so that's pretty concerning, but let's see what else we have. We have a persistent dry cough for option number two. Well, we already knew that when we were kind of going through what we already know about ACE inhibitors, and we said that's a common side effect. It's not usually indicative of a life-threatening concern, right? So, okay, that's a this is common, I'm going to say. Common side effect. And then we have a blood pressure of 142 over 92. What might that mean? Well, it doesn't really tell me um, that there's a side effect happening. It tells me that the lisinopril might not be working as well as it should be, right? Because that's still kind of high, higher than what I would expect to see in somebody who was medicated for hypertension. So maybe they need a higher dose of lisinopril or maybe they need a different blood pressure medication. But is there anything that's causing you to think there's a life-threatening concern there? No, not really. It's just saying that their medication really isn't, isn't doing what it should be, right? And then we have our last option, which is feeling lightheaded when standing quickly. What might that mean? Or what might that be a sign of? That makes me think of orthostatic hypotension, right? So we see that um, when blood pressure drops, when clients stand up too quickly, and that's a common side effect of a lot of blood pressure medications, right? So. Um, we might need to educate our client that they should be standing up really slowly so that they don't fall over, um, but not necessarily a life-threatening reaction, right? So what do you guys think? What is most concerning here? I am thinking angioedema, right? And that could be, um, and we might see itchy lips and tongue when that's first starting to develop. And I am seeing all of you are getting it right. Good job. Yep, someone says lightheaded is expected. Yep, because blood pressure medications can cause that orthostatic hypotension. So I am liking option number one. Let's take a look. Yes, we are correct. Good job. You guys are doing so well. All right, practice question number three. This is going to be a therapeutic communication question. And chances are you may see plenty of these on your NCLEX because why is it important to be a good therapeutic communicator as a nurse? Right? It's going to help us build rapport with our clients, and it's going to help us get the information we need to take really good care of our clients. So in this question, we have a nurse who is taking care, um, who is talking with a client who recently experienced a significant loss. The client states, I'm doing fine. Everything is okay. However, the nurse notices the client is frowning while speaking. Okay, so this is an example of a question where we need to read this um, header really closely because there's a lot of important information in here that we need to know. So the client is saying, I'm doing fine. Everything is okay, but they're also frowning. So what does that mean? That means we have an inconsistency between verbal and nonverbal cues, right? They're not matching up. And so as a nurse, we want to get to the bottom of what's going on, right? So when I'm looking at this question, I'm thinking, okay, I need to find an answer option that is going to kind of explain this discrepancy between verbal and nonverbal communication. And I also want to do it using therapeutic communication, okay? So we have a lot of boxes to check when we're looking for the right answer. And so we're being asked in this question, which of the following would be an appropriate response for the nurse to make? So this means we're looking for one appropriate response, and then we're gonna have three that are inappropriate, right? Because we always wanna read this stem really carefully so we know what we're looking for. So before we look at our answer options, let's take a look and refresh our memory about what we know about therapeutic communication. And of course, we have a really handy table for this. So therapeutic communication is going to fall into kind of three big categories. Our first one is going to be active listening. And so these are basically statements um, that show the client that we hear them, we're listening, we're engaged in the conversation, and we understand what they're saying. So we might restate something back to them, or we might kind of reflect what they're saying back to them so that they know that we're paying attention, right? 
It's a big part of therapeutic communication. Next, we have our open-ended questions. So what are the difference between open and closed-ended questions? Does anybody know? So open-ended questions are designed to get more information where closed-ended questions are gonna have that yes or no response. So let me give you a quick example. So if I were to ask you, are you studying for your NCLEX? You're gonna say yes, right? <laughs> yes, you are definitely studying for your NCLEX. But that doesn't give me a lot of information other than I know that you're studying for your NCLEX. But if I were to ask you an open-ended question where I say, tell me about how you're studying for your NCLEX, you might tell me about your study habits, you might tell me about the resources you're using, you might tell me about how much time you're spending studying. So you can see that's gonna give me a lot more information and that's gonna be really helpful when I'm trying to learn about a client or trying to solve problems, right? And then lastly, we have our non-judgmental communication. And this is really, really important because nobody likes to feel judged, right? And if we feel judged, chances are we're going to shut down. We're not going to want to answer any questions that this nurse is asking us, right? Because we don't want to feel judged. So it's really important that in all of our therapeutic communication that we remain really non-judgmental. So in knowing what we know about therapeutic communication, let's find out if we can determine which of these responses would be appropriate. And I think this one might be a little more challenging because I'm kind of seeing a smattering of all the answer options you guys are answering. I've seen some ones, I've seen some fours, I see a three. No one's picking option number two though, so that's good. All right, let's take a look at what we have. So our first option is, I can see you're feeling upset. Tell me more about what's bothering you. Okay, so what do you guys think about the last part of this? Tell me more about what's bothering you. <clears throat> I like it, it's an open-ended question. We're inviting the client to tell us what's happening. But what do you think about this? I can see that you're feeling upset. There's something wrong with this statement. Does anybody know? So this is making an, ass an assumption. We're saying, I can see you're feeling upset. So we're assuming that because they're frowning, that they're upset. That's kind of a judgment about how they're feeling, isn't it? So we never want to make assumptions. We never want to make judgments about what might be going on in the client's head. So that causes me to not like this option so much, right? So I am gonna cross this one off. I don't like that. I don't like making this assumption about how they're feeling. I think there's a better way that we can phrase that. So let's look at option number two. Okay, I understand. If you want to talk more about her, how you're feeling, I'm here for you. Well, I like this last part. I'm here for you, the nurse is offering support. That's nice, right? But what about the rest of this? We're just saying, okay, I understand, but we really don't, right? There's this inconsistency between verbal and nonverbal cues, and we don't understand what's going on and we're not asking about it. Um, question number two just kind of glosses right by. We're not addressing this inconsistency between verbal and nonverbal communication at all, right? This isn't gonna give us any information, so. Nobody picked that one, and you're correct. We don't want to phrase it like that. Option number three. Okay, I'm glad to hear everything is okay. Is there anything specific you'd like to discuss today? What do you guys think about this last piece? Is there anything specific you'd like to discuss today? That's a closed question, isn't it? How do you think they're going to answer that? They're probably going to say no, right? Because they're not really going to think that you are interested in what's going on if we phrase it like that. And then we're saying, I'm glad to hear everything is okay. What do you think about that? I'm not such a fan of that because we're just taking the client's word at face value. They're saying everything's okay and we're like, great, glad to hear it. But we don't, we're not addressing the fact that the client's frowning when they're saying it. So this isn't gonna help us figure out what's going on between this uh, verbal and nonverbal communication discrepancy. So. We're going to rule that one out too. So that leaves us with option four. So I hope this is phrased better. Um, okay, so you mentioned everything is fine, but your facial expression seems to show otherwise. I'd like to hear more about that. Yeah, I like this one, right? Because what do we have here? I'd like to hear more about that. That's an open-ended question. That's going to invite the client to share what they're thinking about. And then we say, you mentioned everything's fine, but your facial expression seems to show otherwise. So do you notice the difference between one and four? One, we're saying, I can see you're upset. 
And two, we're saying, you mentioned that things are fine, but your facial expression doesn't seem to match, right? So we have this um, kind of just neutral observation about what's happening. So there's no judgment there. So I like that one. And it seems like a lot of you guys are liking that as the option too. So are we correct? We are. Option number four is the winner. All right. We are moving on to practice question number four. So I told you guys I'm a psychiatric nurse, right? So you shouldn't be surprised. I included a mental health question in our practice questions. And this one is about schizophrenia. And schizophrenia is a highly testable condition on the NCLEX. So it's gonna to pay to know a little bit about this condition. So in this question, we have a nurse who is observing a staff member caring for a client who has schizophrenia and is experiencing auditory hallucinations. Which of the following statements by the staff member to the client would require the nurse to intervene. So this is another example of why we want to read closely because that was kind of a mouthful. So we're looking for the statement that would cause the nurse to intervene. So that means we're looking here for an inappropriate statement. So three of these are going to be appropriate. One is going to be inappropriate. So before we answer this question, Let's review what we know about caring for a client who's experiencing psychosis. And if any of you have done our schizophrenia case study, you may recognize this table because it's very similar to the one we used in the case walkthrough. So the thing we need to remember is that when clients are experiencing psychosis, they are not interpreting reality correctly. And so there's a couple things that we need to keep in mind when we're interacting with these clients so that we um, are able to support them in the best way that we can. So let's start off with the things we don't want to do because I think these are a little easier to remember. So the first thing we don't want to do is to refer to the hallucinations as if they are real. So we don't want to say things like, where are the aliens at? Why are the spies trying to get you? Um, what are the evil robots doing? So like, whatever the hallucination is, we don't want to refer to it as if it is real because that's going to reinforce that psyche or that um, reinforce that content for the client. So if we're referring to it as if it's real, they're going to think, oh, the nurse also thinks that these evil robots or these spies or these aliens are real. So that makes it feel even more real to the client. So we don't want to do that. The other thing we don't want to do is to negate the client's experience or directly contradict what they're experiencing. So examples of this might include saying things like, that's not real, there's nothing there, that's not what's happening, because it's important to remember that these clients are likely already feeling paranoid. And these hallucinations that they're experiencing feel very real to them. And so if we come in and say, that's not what's happening, that's not real, it could cause that client to feel very suspicious of us and even distrust us. It's gonna damage our therapeutic relationship. So we do want to reinforce reality, but we want to do it in a much more neutral way. And that's where the things we do want to do come in. So instead of saying things like, that's not happening, that's not real, we want to respond with neutral observations. So instead of saying things like, there are no angry voices. Instead, we want to say, I don't hear any angry voices. We're just giving our objective opinion of what we are perceiving, right? We're not challenging what's happening for them, okay? We also want to acknowledge the client's experience. So we don't want to say things like, where are the aliens at? We want to acknowledge the feelings that those hallucinations are causing. So we want to say things like, that must be really frightening, that must be very scary, that sounds very upsetting, because it probably is very upsetting, right? And so we want to empathize with the client and help them trust us and build rapport, right? And lastly, there are a couple things we can do to help distract the client away from hallucinations and make their symptoms a little bit more manageable. So we do want to distract them. And so that might include simple concrete tasks like engaging them in a simple art project or a card game. Because what we don't wanna do is leave them alone to get wrapped up in their head with these hallucinations. We want to bring them to a reality-based topic so we can focus on the here and now, okay? We can also engage the client in reality testing. So if the client is starting to show some insight into the fact that they're experiencing hallucinations, we can help them 
um, test reality. And so this might look like asking them to look around. Do other people seem to be frightened as well? Or do other people seem to be hearing what you're hearing? So again, notice we're not directly contradicting what they're experiencing. We're just saying, hey, look around. Let's observe reality together. The other thing that is helpful when clients uh, start to show some insight into experiencing hallucinations, we can help them um, manage those hallucinations. And one way we do this is by teaching them to tell the hallucinations to go away, right? This can help reduce the hallucinations and it can make them feel more in control of their symptoms, okay? And then the last thing that is really helpful, especially for clients who are experiencing auditory hallucinations, is what's called competing auditory stimuli. So what this means is we might do things like listen to music with them. We could engage them in a conversation. And the reason we do this and the reason why it's helpful is that it's really hard for a client to focus on the internal stimuli of a auditory hallucination while also listening to an external stimuli like music or conversation. So we can distract their attention away from that auditory hallucination by engaging them with external sounds like music or conversation. Okay, so that was a pretty big review of the do's and don'ts of what we should do when caring for a client who's experiencing psychosis, specifically hallucinations. So now that we've kind of gone over that, let's go back to our question and see if we can figure out which one of these is an inappropriate statement to make. Okay, so first off, our, or so our first option is why don't we listen to some music together? What do you guys think about that? I like that, right? That is a competing auditory stimuli. That is very appropriate for a client who's experiencing auditory hallucinations, right? Would that cause me to intervene? No, that is a very, very appropriate thing to do. I like it. Okay, option number two, let's go play a card game together with the rest of the group. What do you guys think? I like this one too, right? We wanna play a card game. We wanna distract them with a reality-based activity and we're gonna bring them back to the rest of the group we don't wanna leave them isolated. So that is a twofold way that can be really helpful for a client who's experiencing hallucinations. So I don't need to intervene with that one. I think that is very appropriate. Option three, I will help you and together we can tell the voices to go away. Well, we just kind of reviewed that, right? Is that helpful? That's gonna help the client feel like they are in control of their symptoms, right? If they're showing some insight into the fact that they are experiencing hallucinations, right? It can help reduce those auditory hallucinations. So yeah, that would be appropriate too, right? Okay, so that leaves us with option number four. What you're hearing is not real. You are experiencing a hallucination. Yeah, I see a lot of people are getting the answer right. So this is likely a well-intentioned statement because we always want to um, orient the client to reality. Uh-oh. Sorry guys, my pen isn't working. Okay, so we want to orient the client to reality, but what might be a better way to do that? So instead of saying what you're hearing is not real, what might we say instead? We might say, um, I'm not hearing any voices, right? That might be a more neutral way to say it. Okay, so I like it. Number four is the answer of choice. All right, so let's go back and take a look and see. And yes, we were correct. So that brings us to our last practice question, and that is going to be on delegation. So in this question, we have a charge nurse who is supervising a registered nurse in the care of a client on a mechanical ventilator. So the charge nurse should intervene if the RN asks the, asks the unlicensed assistive personnel to do which of the following tasks. So in this question, we're being asked which one of these would be inappropriate to delegate. Okay, so three of these would be appropriate to delegate and one of these is going to be inappropriate. So before we take a look at our answer options, again, we're gonna step back and we're gonna think, what do we know about delegation? 
So let's look at our delegation table, our five rights of delegation. So we need, when we're asking ourselves which of the following tasks would be appropriate or inappropriate, we need to ask ourselves, do we have the right person? So in this case, is our UAP competent? And do they have the skill and knowledge to complete this task? Okay, then we need to ask ourselves, is it the right task? So is it within this UAP scope of practice to do what we're asking them to do? We need to figure out if it's the right circumstance. So this might be easier if I give you an example. So if we were to ask a UAP to do a client transfer, that would be, they would have the skill and knowledge to do that. It would be within their scope of practice. But what if that client was just fresh back from a total knee replacement or a total hip replacement? Would it be the right circumstance to ask them to do that transfer for the first time? Probably not, right? Because we want to assess them first before we ask them to do that transfer. So in that case, it would not be the right circumstance. We also need to make sure we have the right direction, the right communication. So is our UAP um, understanding what we're asking them to do? Do they have any questions? And then lastly, are we able to supervise and evaluate the outcome of what we're asking them to do? Because we as the nurse are always going to be responsible for the outcome of that task, even if we're delegating it. So now that we have refreshed our memory on delegation, let's go back and see if we can figure out which one of these would be inappropriate to delegate to our UAP. Okay, so we have our first option, which is to turn the client from left from the left to the right every two hours. So does a UAP have the skill and knowledge to perform this? Yeah, that should be part of their training, right? Is it within the scope of, in, within the scope of their practice? Yes, absolutely. Is this a routine task with an expected outcome? Well, why would we be turning the client every two hours? probably to prevent skin breakdown, right? So we can evaluate that, we can check their skin, we can make sure it's not breaking down. So we're answering yes to all of these. So do we feel like this is appropriate to delegate to our UAP? Yeah, I think so. So let's look at our second option. And that is to notify the RN when the client requires inline suctioning. Okay, so how would our UAP know when our client requires suctioning? Well, they would probably have to assess them, right? Maybe listen to their lung sounds, um, interpret their O2 saturation. Does the UAP have the skill and knowledge to be able to do this? Well, we can't assume that because assessing is really, it's not part of their training, is it? They are not trained to assess. Is it within their scope of practice to make this assessment? No, it's not. So would this be an appropriate task to delegate? I feel like probably not, but let's look at our other options and see um, if we notice anything else. So our third one is to perform passive range of motion exercises on the extremities. Okay, is it does the UAP have the skill and knowledge to perform passive range of motion exercises? Yes, that's part of their training, right? Is it within the scope of practice? Yes. Is it a routine task with an expected outcome? I would say so, right? Because if we're performing range of motion exercises, our outcome is going to be that they maintain range of motion, right? So would that be appropriate to delegate? Yeah, yeah, you guys are right. And last option is number four, measure the client's respiratory rate and pulse oximetry reading. Okay, would this be within the UAP scope of practice to measure and collect data? Yes, because are we asking them to interpret this data? And are we asking them to assess based off this data? No, right? So this would be much more appropriate than this, right? They can collect data, like in this question, but a UAP cannot interpret that data. So what do you guys think? Who would you intervene for? I like this one, right? because we cannot ask our UAP to assess, right? Should we check our answer on our final question? We are correct. You guys are five for five. I'm really impressed. I'm seeing a lot of you are getting the right answers. So I have high hopes you are gonna do well on your NCLEX. All right. So this brings us to the end of our practice questions for today. I hope that you all found this helpful. 
I am going to leave you with some links. So make sure that you follow us on social media and Amber is going to be dropping those links in the chat as well. Um, we are doing weekly webinars, so we hope that you can tune in. If you happen to miss one, they are archived here on our Facebook page. And of course, if you have any friends who are also studying for their NCLEX, make sure that you invite them over because we love having new people join the group. We love hearing from our students. We love hearing um, uh, how the NCLEX went for you, when it's scheduled for. Um, so I'm going to hang out here for a couple more minutes to answer any questions if you have any, or if you just want to pop in and say hi. I would love to see that too. <laughs> All right. It looks like someone maybe is taking their NCLEX today. If that's what that means. If you are, good luck. Hello, hello. Thank you for saying hi. Good, I'm glad you found this helpful. Awesome. And always, yeah, leave us comments on Facebook. We love seeing your comments. It really makes our week when we hear from you. Um, if you've used our products and passed the NCLEX, definitely drop us a note. It really does make our week. All right, I see a couple of people saying they struggle with mental health topics. We've got a whole question bank devoted to mental health on boot camp, so be sure to check it out. Awesome. All right, well, I am going to wrap it up. Um, if anybody's taking their NCLEX soon, I wish you all the best of luck. Oh, Karen says mental health is your favorite topic. <laughs> That's awesome. All right, I wish you all the best of luck with your studying, and I'll see you again soon. Bye.